Hello everyone, I'm the Saxy Gamer. Today we're here for yet another Civilization 6 leader spotlight. The very last of all of the leader spotlights that we are going to have to do for Civilization 6, assuming that they don't release another expansion for it. But today we have Mansa Musa of the Mali. So without further ado, let's get right into things. Mansa Musa's first ability is known as Sahel Merchants, and it makes it so that his international trade routes gain plus one gold for every flat desert tile in the Origin City. In addition to this, he receives plus one trade capacity every time he enters a Golden Age. Sahel Merchants is a very strong ability, especially considering the fact that you're probably going to be locating yourself in the desert as Mansa Musa because he does have a desert spawn bias. The only thing to watch out for here is that they do have to be flat desert tiles, so although uh, hill desert tiles are better yield-wise, you do have to make sure that these are flat in order for you to get the gold. But assuming that you have a good spot where you have a lot of flat desert tiles, you can get a ton of extra gold from Sahel Merchants. The extra trade routes will be nice because they allow you to just get more high gold trade routes, and then you can can use that in a lot of ways on Mansa Musa, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but overall Sahel Merchants, very good. All you gotta watch out for is that you don't have too many desert hills. Mansa Musa's second ability is known as Songs of the Jelly, and it makes it so that his city centers gain plus one faith and plus one food for every adjacent desert and desert hills tile. Um, his mines lose one production, but also gain plus four gold, and he's able to purchase commercial hub district buildings with faith, but he loses 30% production towards constructing buildings or training units. So Songs of the Jelly is a, there's a lot going on with this ability, but overall it still is a very good ability, and it's one that gives Mansa Musa quite a bit of a unique playstyle. So gaining plus one faith and plus one food for every adjacent desert and desert hills tile is really, really nice, especially early on. If you're able to settle a city center with six, uh, you know, surrounded by desert tiles, so six tiles, you get plus six faith in the game, which pretty much guarantees that you're going to get the first Pantheon, and plus six food as well, which makes it so that your city will grow super fast up to, like, I think it's four or five population um, within the first, you know, 20 turns or so. Which means that you're going to be able to work a lot more tiles, which kind of makes up for some of the uh, bad yields of desert tiles that, you know, obviously desert tiles normally don't have good yields on them, um, but getting that high population kind of makes up for that a little bit. Losing one production on mines does hurt, but gaining four gold allows you to use it in kind of a different way, and that's kind of the general style with Mansa Musa that we'll talk about in the very end, but losing that one production does hurt a little bit in certain uh, situations, notably when you're building wonders or things of that sort, or space parts for uh, science victory, but gaining the four gold is nice because it allows you to get quite a bit. Four gold is, you know, not uh, insignificant, and if you have a lot of mines, that can add up very fast. Purchasing commercial hub districts buildings with faith is another nice thing that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, losing production towards constructing buildings or training units really does hurt though, especially early on, because when you uh, when we talk about units, that uh, includes things such as builders and settlers, which means early on it's going to be a real slog to get out your first few settlers and your builders and things of that sort. So um, this really hurts him in the early game. Um, it doesn't really matter that much later on in the game when you can just buy everything with gold, but early on this, this loss of production really hurts. And it, a lot of the time it will take you more than, you know, 20 turns to build your first settler or even to build a scout early on. It will take you like 15 turns or something ridiculous like that just because of this production loss and uh, the overall bad yields of desert tiles. Um, Songs of the Jelly overall, though, um, is still a pretty good ability and it gives Mansa Musa a very unique playstyle. Moving on to the unique unit of the Mali, we have the Mondegalu Cavalry, which is a unique unit that replaces the Knight. It has a melee strength of 49, which is one more than the Knight, a movement of 4, and a production cost of 220, which are both the same as the Knight. The unique abilities of the Mondegalu Cavalry are that it prevents land traders within four tiles of it of uh, being plundered. So, you know, land traders just means that obviously the trader is not on an ocean tile or a lake tile or anything like that. It won't protect those. Um, but it also provides gold equal to the base combat strength of any defeated unit. So overall, the Mondekalu Cavalry, I think, is pretty good. Um, the Knight already, just as itself, is pretty good, so getting uh, plus one more combat strength. I mean, plus one combat strength isn't really going to make much of a difference, um, but obviously it's better than not having any boost, so that is uh, that count for, counts for something, and it is no more expensive than the Knight itself, so that's also very nice. Not uh, making it so that your land traders cannot be plundered within four tiles is actually something that's really nice because of how heavily Mansa Musa relies on gold. So if you're not making gold on Mansa Musa, you're going to have a really tough time because of how much production you don't get from mines and how much you just lose towards buildings and units. So making sure that your traders are not plundered if you're at war with someone is really important. So the Mondekalu Cavalry can be really good for protecting your traders and keeping your gold output nice and high. Getting extra gold um, equal to the base combat strength of any defeated unit, it's 
it's nice, but like it's not really that nice just because in any given war you're probably not going to kill more than, you know, like 10 or 20 units and really that's not going to add up to all that much gold because most of the units you fight at the time you have them on Dekalu Cavalry will be less than 50 uh, combat strength, so getting less than 50 gold per kill and if you only kill, you know, like 10 of them, that's, I mean, that's 500 gold, which is okay, but really in the grand scheme of things that's going to be like two turns worth of gold for Mansa Musa, so that extra gold is... It's, I guess it's it's something, so, you know, I can't really bash on it too much because it's it's better than nothing, but at the same time, it's not really that significant in comparison to all the other gold that Mansa Musa makes. So overall, for the Mondekalu Cavalry, um, a really good unit for a good timing push and something that you probably should make use of in any game because you can get a lot of them really easily. You can just purchase a, a bunch, um, go fight somebody, gain a little bit of extra land, and then move on with your life in the game. Mansa Musa's unique district is known as the Saguba, and it is a replacement for the commercial hub, very fittingly considering how much of a gold-focused leader Mansa Musa is. But in addition to all of the normal bonuses and adjacency bonuses of the commercial hub, the Saguba will gain plus two gold from each adjacent holy site, it will gain a 20% discount on all gold and faith purchases in the city, and it only costs half of the production cost of a normal commercial hub. So the Saguba, I think, is a really strong, unique district, and it's really one of the things that makes Mansa Musa as unique as he is. So starting off, getting that extra gold from adjacent holy sites is really strong, because what you can do, and what I find that is just a generally really good thing to do on Mansa Musa, is since you're probably going to be guaranteed that first pantheon, you can get... Um, Oh man, I can't remember. Uh, you can get Desert Folklore, that's the name of it, um, that gets you a extra adjacency bonus on your holy sites from Desert Tiles, so you can get a very easy plus six holy site. Um, if you put this somewhere that's next to your city center as well, and uh, near a river, then you can sandwich the Saguba between the holy site and your city center along the river, and then you'll, in, in addition to having a plus six holy site, you'll also have a plus five gold uh, adjacency Saguba, which is pretty insane. Then you're going to get that 20% discount on all gold and faith purchases in the city, so not only are you going to have a high uh, faith yield and a high gold yield, you're also going to be able to purchase things for cheap, and remember, you're able to purchase um, commercial hub district buildings with faith, so you can use the faith that you got from the um, city center from Songs of the Jelly and from the holy site with its extra adjacency to purchase all your buildings immediately in the commercial hub or the Saguba in this case and then you can use that gold to purchase other buildings or units or pretty much whatever you want so the big play style with Mansa Musa is obviously just to purchase as many things as you can and the Saguba is one of the things that makes this very possible because it allows you to get a high gold output it synergizes well with the uh, the holy sites and just the faith generation of Mansa Musa and it gives you a discount on all of that which is super nice so overall the Saguba I think is a very strong district and one that fits Mansa Musa very well and now it is that time to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of Mansa Musa and the Mali in Civilization 6. So for his first strength, one of the strongest things about Mansa Musa is that he has a very cohesive playstyle. All of his abilities and unique attributes like his Saguba and his Mondekalu Cavalry, they all work together really well and they synergize together very well to give him a very well defined and, you know, quite strong playstyle. So as I mentioned before, really the, the big thing with Mansa Musa is that instead of focusing on production, you are going to be focusing on gold and faith output to purchase everything rather than produce it. Um, and this works very well because he gets um, extra gold from both of his abilities. He gets the extra gold from the mines and from his trade routes if he has flat desert tiles. He gets a discount on his uh, on his um, purchases if he has a Saguba in the city. He can get extra faith from his city centers. He can purchase commercial hub buildings with faith. And all of it just works very well to make sure that he has a very well-defined and very unique playstyle. There are really no other leaders in Civ 6 that have a playstyle quite like Mansa Musa's because really on everyone else you want to just focus on production and get that as high as you can, but on Mansa Musa that doesn't really matter that much. Your production is not your focus because you lose production on your mines and you get a production penalty for uh, units and buildings, so it's really not as important as your gold and faith outputs are, but just the, the overall synergy between his abilities and how cohesive his playstyle is is easily one of the strongest things about him. One of the other big strengths of just his general playstyle is that focusing on gold and faith rather than production adds a lot of flexibility to your game. So the one way to think about gold and faith in Civ 6 in the context of Mansa Musa is that it's like it's similar to production except it is more variable because you can use it in any one of your cities. So you know normally whenever you're getting production in one city you're limited to using it in that city. 
But with Mansa Musa, producing gold in all of your cities allows you to purchase things in all of your cities. So even if you go and freshly put down a brand new city, you can immediately purchase so many things to build that city up like right off the bat. You don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to deal with it having terrible production because you just settled it. You can immediately go purchase a bunch of things and you can be, you know, well off right from the start. Um, this also means that, you know, if you're attacked suddenly or something like that, somebody declares a surprise war on you, and you have a lot of gold built up, you can immediately just give yourself a huge army by purchasing things in all of your cities, all in one uh, one single turn, and then you're able to fight back with ease. So, just the amount of flexibility that you get from focusing on gold and having just a huge stockpile of gold rather than, uh, you know, focusing on production adds a lot of flexibility to your game, and it's, it makes it so that you can react to things very easily. Um, not to mention the fact that with both Moksha and Reina, you can get the promotions on those governors that allow you to purchase districts with faith and gold, which is something I would 100% recommend with Mansa Musa because then, you know, you can purchase districts pretty much immediately, you can purchase districts in those, or you can purchase buildings in those districts, and you can get your yields up very fast and, you know, for a very low cost considering how much gold you're going to be making. So, easily one of the best things about Mansa Musa as well. Mansa Musa's big weakness is that um, the production loss that he gets hurts a lot of aspects of his game, um, namely his early game. His early game is so terrible. It is, you know, normally I love to complain about how slow leaders that need religions are, but Mansa Musa's early game, you know, with needing a religion and losing that production really hurts him, and it makes his early game so, it's just, it's a slog to get through it, honestly, because it's gonna take you forever to build settlers and to build builders, or even to build scouts, or if you get attacked before you have enough gold built up and you know before you have traders going um, then you're pretty much just done because it's gonna take you forever to build anything and until you get your gold output up a lot um, you're gonna have a really uh, like a really terrible time uh, the other area where he is kind of hurt is that uh, in producing wonders he is going to not have quite as much production as no most other leaders just because he doesn't get as much production from mines so it is gonna take him a little bit longer to construct wonders as well which can make it hard to compete for some of the wonders in the game especially the important ones like the culture victory ones if you're going for a culture victory um, so you do have to be a little bit more you know uh, preemptive with your planning for those wonders and you have to get to those techs a little bit earlier otherwise you are going to struggle to complete them in time and now it is time for the very last time to give Mansa Musa his tier ranking. So I'm not going to talk too much because I've already rambled on for, you know, how many minutes? Probably 12 minutes at this point. Um, and you've, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but as always, Domination is up first. And for the very last time, it is up first. Um, and I think Mansa Musa deserves a B in Domination. He is a fairly competent Domination leader. Um, as I've already mentioned, you can just uh, use the amount of gold that you have to immediately purchase a huge army and use that to go obliterate somebody. In addition to that, you also do have plenty of gold to keep up with unit maintenance costs, so both of those things are very nice for Mansa Musa, and I think they both make him deserving of the B. Science is up next, and I, once again, think that he deserves a B. Um, really, what you can do with him for science is you can use your religion and your gold output to kind of synergize well with leaning you towards the science victory. So, you can use religious beliefs like Jesuit education, and um, I forget what the other one is. The One of the ones that gives you science for having followers in other civilizations, but you can use that to get your science yield up a little bit, and you can purchase the buildings in the, uh, the campus district with faith, which allow you to get science yields very quickly and allows you to build up your, you know, your overall empire towards science focus. So, for that reason, I think that he does deserve the B. One of the things that is a little bit more difficult for him, though, is building space parts, just because he doesn't have quite as much production from mines, so it is going to take you a few extra turns to build those space parts, but overall, I still think that he makes up for it with his, uh, with his ease of getting campus districts and buildings in them as well. Culture is up next, and I once again think that he deserves a B pretty much for all of the reasons that he deserved the B in science. So he's able to purchase his theater square districts, he's able to purchase buildings in those theater square districts for super cheap, and he does have the issue of making it so that it uh, does take a little bit longer for him to produce wonders rather than space parts, you know, for culture victory. Um, so that does make it a little bit more difficult for him and prevents him from being in higher tiers, but overall the ease of getting those buildings and districts uh, makes him at least a decent leader, and you can use your religion to synergize with all of that as well to give you a little bit of extra culture or tourism or anything of that sort. So for that reason, I think he deserves the B in culture. 
Religion is up next, and I definitely think that he deserves an S in religion. He is one of the best religious leaders in the game. Um, so you get all of that extra faith early on. If you settle your uh, first city in, in the middle of a desert, you'll get six faith to start out, which, for one, that gives you a ton of faith building up from turn one, and two, it allows you to get your pantheon way before anybody else will. You can then get desert folklore to get insane adjacency bonuses on your holy sites, and then with the Saguba, you'll have a discount on all of your faith purchases, which includes your missionaries and apostles, which just means that you can spam those like there is no tomorrow and convert everybody to your religion. So I easily think that Mansa Musa is one of the best religious leaders in the game and well deserving of the S tier ranking. Diplomacy is last, and I think he deserves a C. Um, not much to say here, really. He just doesn't really have any bonuses towards it, and there's not really anything that prevents him from, you know, playing towards diplomacy or becoming suzerain of city-states or forming alliances or anything of that sort. Um, so for that reason, he's just fairly average and deserves the C. And for Mansa Musa's overall ranking and the very last of the overall rankings that I will be giving in Civilization VI, um, I think that Mansa Musa deserves a B. He's a pretty good leader. He's not um, outstanding in any, I mean, he is outstanding in religion, but um, as an overall leader, he's definitely not, like, outstanding. He's not top tier, but he is still a good leader and one that is fun to play just because of how different his playstyle is from all of the other leaders in the game. So focusing on gold and faith to purchase everything rather than using production to build things is something that really no other leader in the game does, and if you haven't tried out Mansa Musa, I would highly recommend that you do. So thank you everyone for watching, I have been the Saxy Gamer. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, if not, feel free to dislike. If you're looking for more Civilization VI content, feel free to subscribe. Thank you for everybody that has, you know, watched me throughout the entirety of the Leader Spotlight series. There will be some more leader-related stuff coming up in the next week or two. Um, I'm going to go back and revisit my tier ranking spreadsheet and make any changes, you know, final changes to that spreadsheet um, based on the changes that have happened to some of the leaders that I have covered in the past um, since I have covered them. So that will be a video probably coming out either this week or next week. And then I'm going to go ahead and redo all of the, the, the top leaders in each category and top overall leaders that I did after Rise and Fall came out. So those will be coming out over the next few weeks as well, so be looking out for those. But thank you everyone for watching, and goodbye.